So today's topic is how to clean your data and it's preparing to move to a data management solution. We thought that it would be great if we put a three part series together to prepare customers who are thinking about moving to a PDM solution. A lot of customers come to us and they're like, hey, we're ready to go join, do a PDM solution, but there's a lot of thought that needs to be put into it before you move to a PDM solution. So today on the call, the joining me, I'm Phil Steiger, by the way, and I oversee the vault and PLM practice. I'm the practice lead here at Kativ. I also have Jason Cordemanch with me, who is our vault and PLM architect. And I also have Jose, and I always mess up his name. <laughs> He's laughing at me. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it, Jose. I just can't. But it is clear. Yeah, I just don't have that. It just doesn't roll <laughs> off the tongue like it does when you say it. <laughs> um, all three of us work closely together all the time. So thank you both for joining us, joining me today on this journey. So we'll start off with some poll questions today. And uh, we have three here today. They're very uh, interesting. Um, how many how many different places are you storing your data today? The other one is, uh, do you have a PDM system? And the third is, is all of your data in your PDM system? Give you guys a few minutes to answer those questions. Hopefully here we can get some results. That's a good mix of uh, single source, three or more. The third question is interesting. It's all your data in a, in a PDM system. Everyone answered no. Hmm. It's good. This topic will really help, I think, everybody today. Let's get started. So what we're going to cover today, clean data. Do you know where all your data is being stored? Standardized folder structure and naming convention, centralizing all your data, developing a naming scheme. Uh, renaming files, standardized libraries, and removing duplicate files. So I thought I'd throw a little cart, a little humor in here today to get started. Who wants clean data? You realize everybody's going to raise their hand. Everybody wants clean data. But then you ask the question, who wants to clean the data? You just you can't get anybody to want to actually do the work to clean the data. So you know where your data is being stored? That's a big question. And I know a lot of people will say, yes, I do. But when you come to digging into where your data is, you probably don't know where all your data is being stored. And so this is just a perfect example of an engineering group saying, oh, we know where all our files are. But then when you go and you dig into other servers and everything, some of your files are located on other servers. And the biggest thing that I see that happens if you're not using a PDM solution is you have your files sort of locked down, they have read only permissions, but then somebody needs one of those files and they want to make a change to it. And instead of going through the proper channels and having that change made the right way, they copy and paste and they store it on another server or on their own personal drive, they make a change to it and they email it out to a customer or they send it to the shop floor for production. I think Jason and Jose have seen this also and they can talk more in depth about some of the other things that might happen. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like, it's easy to forget that because of storing data in multiple places or the example Phil just gave, it's like, it's it's those kinds of workarounds that 
produces, you know, dirty data or, or cause now you have two copies, which one's the latest, which one was manufactured, uh, which one would you send to a tech to use as a reference in the field? Like, you know, these small decisions, you know, everyone's done it. We're in a hurry. We don't want to ask for permission to get access to read, write, you know, cause we need to get something out yesterday and it needs to get out today. And so it's like these kinds of um, external strains really kind of encourage people, unfortunately, to to make these small little changes to get a job done, but not not thinking about the the lasting or the compounding effect of what happens when you have two or three copies of the same file, or you know, latest latest, or you know, whatever the naming convention is. But it's really interesting, like. It starts as a, yeah, as a small problem, but it, it grows so fast and it's easy to not be fully aware of how big the problem is until you, you start to clean it up. Exactly. You lose access to a main drive on a very busy day. You need to get something out. You're like, all right, I'm going to share it here. That way you can access it. I'm getting it to you so that you can release it and get it out to the shop. All of a sudden, I never get access back to, to that original drive. We started new sharing location all of a sudden it just blows out of proportion and we're we're duplicating information here and there and you know everywhere at that point so it's just one of the conversations we have during uh implementations right as well with our customers we talk to them and say well how do you do things right now and it could just be like we're talking engineering you know within itself um you know variating uh from the workflow but it could be different departments looking for information in different locations. And the only reason that works right now is because there's one person that uh, knows that both of their workflows are different. So they copy it over and that's not what you want. Um, you know, a lot of the times they're not aware. Uh, and a lot of the times it comes out of <laughs> dire need in, in that moment. Oh, and then how much time, what is the cost for an engineer to go look into multiple locations for a document? And then figuring out which document is the actual correct document. Right. Because it's hard to reuse content if you can't find the right content. Right. Just re you'll just remake it or make a model that's very similar. Yeah. So one of the first things we always tell customers is you need to standardize your folder structure and your naming convention around um, because if you think of a PDM system, it's just, you know, just another way, a secure way to have a, a folder structure. You can, it, like in Vault, you can duplicate your folder structure that you have and explore right inside of Vault and do it the same way. Well, if it's a mess in Explorer, moving it into Vault isn't going to make it any better. It's still going to be a mess. So you should, there should be thought behind how you, set up your folder structure before you have a PDM system so that you know you have one main folder maybe or maybe two main folders and then the folders underneath have names that are logical that have some sort of meaning to them then other than just all of a sudden you just have random folders that somebody has created and you're storing documentation now inside those clean it up simplify it don't overcomplicate it. I think that would be my best suggestion is, you know, keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. Whether it's product numbers or order numbers, uh, drawing series numbers, like every company is slightly different, but it's something that you want that can grow that, that you're not going to change in five years, something that will keep growing with the way you're currently doing something. Because that's the worst. It's to spend the time to standardize it just to, try to find the time later to fix it again. And so it's worth spending a little bit of time in the beginning, kind of set it up in a meaningful way because the way that you organize files, especially with, you know, maybe one or two or three levels deep of folders, you know, those folder names provides a significant value for you to actually find what you need. Yeah, that, that, that little caveat that Bill mentioned there is, yeah, it can match what your folder structure is now. But do you want it to like uh, <laughs> how do you right. want it to be working not, not how it doesn't have to be how it's working now if you don't like how it's working now 
you know, let's have an internal discussion, figure out how you want it to work. And we'll, we'll start that structure within. Jason gave some examples of, of the ways that it can be set up. You can have by customer. Sometimes that, that's how our customers like to set it up as well, or by machine type. You can split it up however you know it makes sense for for everyone to access it. Oh, but also re also remembering keeping the folder structure simple because once you do move into a PDM solution, you're going to have a lot more power for searching. You're not really you'll probably get away from going through folders to find stuff. You'll start doing searches, intelligent searches, because you'll have all sorts of rich metadata behind your file that you can now search on instead of well i'll go to this folder to find this you can now say hey i have a three quarter inch bowl with you know x thread on it where are they at in your search which will make it a lot easier for you so once you came up once you come up with this convention it's putting it in a central server on one server and keeping it there that's i you know that's your should be your goal your progression now you You've come up with a folder structure, you put it on one server, and now you're going to start cleaning that data. You're going to start migrating it from all these multiple locations and putting it into this one location in preparation that, you know, hey, I want to go to a PDM. And so when I go to a PDM, I'm going to have all my files on one server in the folder structure that I want so that when we make this jump, when we make this leap to a PDM, I'm going to be able to just take everything that's on this server and it's going to be organized and ready to go. And I can migrate it up into the PDM solution. And that's and the nice thing about doing something like this is you, you know, you can start on this prior to getting a PDM solution, you know, because this takes many iterations, it takes some time, but will definitely pay off quite a bit later down the road. Yeah, you're creating that source of truth, right? You're creating that one location that you're going to upload everything from and making sure that it's accurate for you move into a PDM solution. Right, and it's cheaper to do it on the front end than it is to try to go to a PDM and nothing's clean, and then you're spending a lot of time trying to get everything clean. Also, you want your ROI to, for moving to a PDM to be, everybody uses that. Because if you still have data on a server and you have data in your new PDM solution, the the amount of time somebody's going to spend looking for stuff in the PDM and then going and looking for stuff on servers, it cuts down on your ROI. You really want to make that you, when you're selling it to the leadership that, hey, the PDM is going to be where we want to go because it's going to do X, Y, and Z for us. Well, part of that is the ROI, how it's going to improve your processes and speed up, you know, engineering. But if the engineer is spending 10, 15 minutes outside of the PDM looking for stuff every time he wants to look for a file, start adding that up over weeks and you look at his, you know, his costs for the business, that can be tens of thousands of dollars that are wasted in his time trying to find files. And you're risking adoption at that point too, right? Because you're not yes. only selling it to higher ups, you're selling it to the users. Because to them, it's just an additional tool. Maybe at first they see it as more time, more picks and clicks they have to go through. And it's this new program they have to work with. Well, if it's not set up for their success and they're still having to go outside of the PDM tool to find things, then you know they they you run that risk of reverting it to exactly what they were at before. And just finding things outside of PDM is easier for them and they'll do it that way. So you know, you, you run that risk as well. Well, and we have customers who go to have gone to the PDM and they're not getting full adoption because one of the things is is they have half their files still on a server and some of their stuff in the PDM. And people don't like change. Let's just cut to the chase. Nobody wants to make a change. And going to a PDM solution sometimes is a drastic change for people. And they like the they're stuck in their ways. They like how they do it. So if you give them an option to have two different places, they're always going to revert back to their comfort zone on that. So probably the other biggest thing that we see when we talk to customers that are thinking about going to a PDM is 
they're developing a naming scheme. And so I have three examples of naming, you know, part numbering, very simplistic up here, you know, prefix, part number, dash, suffix. Then you get into the customer who wants to make sure that everything about that part is in the part name. Very complex and stuff. And then you get into the non-intelligent part numbering where it's the part really has no association. The part number has no association with the part itself. And you'd be surprised that when you start looking at your data and start cleaning it up, if you've been bought or you have new engineering managers come in over the years, how many different times that part numbering has changed. And that's a big deal because when you're talking about moving into a PDM, you want to make sure that, that all those, and we'll get into that here in a second about renaming your files, that all your files have the same numbering scheme. So when you put them into the PDM solution, it's clean. Jose, Jason, you want to add to the whole part numbering? You guys see this probably more than I do. Yeah, like, you know, part of me loves the big, very complicated part numbering schemes, but the, the, the hard part that I see is that it works great for a couple of years. But the problem is, is it's very hard and very time consuming to take into account every, um, every option. And it's like, it kind of locks you into a certain set of, of rules. And as soon as you acquire or do another product line or something that doesn't fit within those rules, now you're really stuck because now you're you either have to amend things, add more to it, or or now have two parallel numbering schemes. And so it's like that's the hard part about picking number scheme is, you know, will you be using the same numbering scheme in 10 years? That's hard to know. Does it have everything you need? And so, you know, we've been seeing a kind of a switch for moving away from that because it's so hard to bake in all of the, the metadata and it's easier with PDM systems to add the metadata as other properties and not have to bake everything into uh, the part number. And so that gives us a lot more flexibility to grow and change and still have the metadata to search on and not have to rely about packing all this smart information into you know these special characters. How yeah, many of our customers do you see going to non-intelligent part numbering now? Or are they still can, going with some sort of a numbering scheme? I would say it's it's probably pretty split in terms of, you know, some people at, that have been burnt hard by these very complicated numbering schemes. Those ones I see go all the way over and they want, you know, non-intelligent numbers. But I've, I've said the majority, it's somewhere in between, you know. But yeah. the thing that, about switching part numbers is that, you know, changing a part number in a PDM system is just the beginning. Like it affects purchasing you know there's downstream it affects you know the numbering in erp like changing a number scheme is a big lift because it doesn't it's not just one department and so that's the other hard part is you know the more people you add into the discussion and the decisions the harder it is to try to pick just one formula it's yeah, a critical <laughs> it's a critical piece that you need to think about when you're doing it yeah some of the customers we've worked with kind of like just say, well, from this moment on, we're going to create new part numbers. This is what they'll mean, but we'll still have legacy numbers in there from, you know, th that are already in the system. There's no need for us to change them. We know what they mean and so forth. But yeah, the more information you <clears throat> you're adding in the PDM system, the easier it is to find them anyway. So. Well, and it's hard, like, you know, if you have to service an old equipment and it's like, great, that has the old part number. It's, you know, that's part of it. It's figuring out like, where do you, and how do you document the change? Kind of like the key between the old numbering system and the new numbering system. Cause it's like, it might not be obvious that both numbering schemes are essentially just, you know, the difference between a quarter bolt and a quarter bolt with some sort of finish, um, you know, it can be so subtle. Whereas it's obvious, maybe more obvious with one numbering scheme than the other. And that's what, part of the reason why I think, you know, having an accurate description is so powerful in ERP and in Vault. And so, 
they were not relying only on the part number. Oh, I know from past experiences where we just left the old part number and you went to that old part number and it came up with a page to set the new part number. And that's how they were referencing their old part numbers. So everybody got used to knowing where the new part number was. Definitely. And you can add that as metadata too, which makes it easy in terms of you find it and like, oh, there's the metadata, go to this part number. Right. So let's talk about renaming files because we seem to be doing a lot of this for our customers lately because the customers, you know, and I have examples of different ways that people have named, but I'll let you talk through some of this, Jason, because you seem to do this a lot. Yeah, it's it's just part of what happens, especially when you're working on files outside of, either inside a PDM system or outside, is that we get busy, um, especially outside of a PDM system. You know, there's no great way to document the rev, whatever the revision number is. And, you know, this is a, a great example. We see it all the time, you know, the revision gets put into the file name and then now you have three or four copies of the same assembly at different revs. We've seen the rev number in, you know, an I property or something like that, which is hard to search or, or know that you're looking at the correct one, especially if you've had, you know, some customers are, you know, have rev one installed other customers have rev two of the product installed and so you know all these clever tricks are just a band-aid and they're in my mind there it's just a warning sign of like we really need a pdm system because we're doing things that a pdm system is designed to do it's like in my mind that's a good warning sign of like it's time to make the switch um and sooner the better because even know that you know putting the rev of the number of the file and the file name works you're only creating more work later when you try to go to a pdm system because now you now you have to load the data you have to rename the files you have to get the rev number out of the file name and get it into the correct revision place for that software or that pdm system you know that's a lot of extra value and a lot of extra time to do it right um and that's the hard part. It's like, do you even have the time to do that? You know, because most people are so busy trying to get the next product out the door. It's part of the reason why I think a lot of companies don't implement a PDM system. It's not that they don't want one. It it takes you know money. It takes time. Um, it takes time for training, and all that interrupts the current day to day operations. Um, and if you've you know have used or created, you know, gigs or hundreds of gigs of data. Um, you know, some of the stuff we see, it's just easier to put it all into a PDM system and don't rename anything. And then, you know, create a new numbering scheme for new products and move forward. And probably the most common thing I see is at the very least, you fix the library files so that all new assemblies are referencing the correct part numbers. And so that way we're not continuing the problem, um, especially when we want to cr eventually create items from these part numbers and part names and eventually link those to other systems like an ERP or PLM, that's where the part of the file renaming is critical because it's the file name that creates the part number. It's the part number that creates the item number. And then it's the item number that has to match or get connected to whatever the item number is in another system. And so it's easy to forget, you know, we're not talking about just file names. We're talking about a small setting that affects a lot of other settings. And the beauty of it is, is we do now have tools to help. We've done several renaming projects for customers who have had these weird, they said they had clean data. And I go back to that slide. <laughs> hey, oh yeah, our data is clean. But then when we got into looking at the data that they it was like this it was a mishmash of all different types because over the years they changed their naming convention and so we spent time and we ended up renaming a lot of their files for them yeah and and this example is perfect like in my opinion this is the worst kind of claimed of quote claim data because it's not clean and it's not consistent like right. we would almost prefer that like programmically it's all wrong the same way that is simple clean data to get it claimed or simple dirty data this is 
you know, it's obvious us as humans to look at and know what needs to change and what needs to come out of those numbers. But to tell a computer how to evaluate and not mess it up, you know, that's where it gets very time consuming yeah. to claim the data. So it's like, if you're going to do something, you know, <clears throat> like yeah. add the rev, like I would much rather everyone do it wrong the right way. They're the same way. <laughs> I think a key detail that Jason touched on there is, you know, if it's information or data that humans can read, it may seem clean, but it, uh, you want to think of it as I want to put this on a spreadsheet and be able to dissect it and sort it with, you know, some logic, some some form of logic. And that's how you know it's truly clean at that point, because, you know, it's, it's easily sorted, it's easy, easily categor categorized. Uh, that's when I think you can call it clean, clean, clean at that point. Exactly. So uh, one of the other things is, is your standard library files or parts and stuff. And I'll let Jason talk about this and how this affects everything. Yeah, I think this is so critical. And I think it's probably one of the things that I see that gets skipped the most you know, we get excited, we get a 3D modeling tool, we start using it, uh, we learn about either top down or bottom up modeling, and it's very easy to forget about the standard components, you know, it's very easy and tempting, you know, when you need something to go on to a third party website, you know, there's plenty of great vendors that provide CAD models and you just download them, throw them in your model and keep going. But it's like, if we think about PDM systems, you know, one of the tenants of them is data reuse and you can't reuse data if you can't find it. And so centralizing, you know, the hardware you need and it, it helps in terms of by centralizing the hardware, it makes it easier for purchasing to know like we've approved all these sizes. We have vendors that can supply all these sizes. We know what the cost of all these are, you know, by having a standardized library, it also helps new employees not accidentally spec something that's not, you know, not in the warehouse, they're not being stocked. Um, and so that's one of the main benefits of it is, you know, you don't want to waste the time, every employee going and grabbing their own quarter bowl or uh, standard part, when if you have a clean standard library, it's organized, you have the metadata, you know, at that point, it's very easy to just add it to your model. Um, and that way you can start to get a good idea, you know, if we run out of this part, how many, how many products can I not manufacture? You know, you get all kinds of interesting, rich data because of the linking between files that you wouldn't get um, with, without it. Yeah, I was going to say naming schemes also come, numbering schemes come into play here. You know, if you have standard, uh, Standard hardware, you know, you may have a prefix like the one that that uh, that Phil was saying, and it differentiates it from the rest of the manufactured parts. Um, and then metadata, like Jason said, uh, all it takes is someone saying a quarter inch bolt, like in the example there, as opposed to 0.25 that somebody <laughs> uses as a decimal. It's the exact same part. Uh, and purchasing is buying you know, more of it because, you know, one part number hit zero quantity while you still have 250 uh, in, in the in the warehouse being waiting to be used because, you know, only that one person um, named it uh, um, differently. So you know, consistency across and makes makes life so much easier. And this is a good place. I think you're right. Going back to what you were saying about like, number or naming conventions like having a prefix that everyone knows that when you see that prefix on a bill of material you know that's an actual hardware um or a purchased component you know like that i think is a great place for adding value because it's it's a very easy everyone knows that that's purchased and it it helps you kind of group things together um on the bomb and help get the right quantities one of the last things that we had on our, and I didn't, I don't have a slide for it, but you know, it's the duplicate files and how do you handle the duplicate files that you might have? And one of the suggestions <clears throat> that we always say is 
create an obsolete folder and put everything that you think is duplicate in that obsolete folder until you realize whether or not it is or isn't. And then eventually you might be able to get rid of that obsolete folder. And there are programs out there that allow you to run scans on your data that'll get down to the bit level and tell you if the files are exactly the same or what is changed in those files that can really help you determine if you have two exact files and you can't really tell if there's something changed, you could run a scan on it and it will tell you, you know, date created and what's been changed on it. I do have one question. It says, how often do you run into a master car 3D bolts with threads? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot because because you don't know what you don't know and you get excited you pull it down you start using it and unless you've had the experience of working on a large model you don't understand and it's easy to overlook because the threads are small you don't understand the kind of load that you're adding to a model and i find like once you do it once and you've had that experience you know you'll never forget but it, that's the hard part about getting started you don't know what you don't know Do so you guys have any other takeaways on this that people should be aware of when they're going into thinking about, you know, how I want to move to a PDM solution? I think the standard library is critical because it, it solves so many problems in terms of, you know, standardizing, making it easy to reuse. It, it has, makes things easier for purchasing and quality. Um, and it's like when you add the metadata, you add maybe um, the correct descriptions at that point, then you're also, you know, lowering the chance of accidentally, you know, making a model with the wrong bolt that does maybe not have the tensile strength that you need, but you don't realize it. And so it, having the correct metadata, metadata so that you know that you're specking the correct bolt and that the person putting it together is going to actually use the correct bolt. I think it's probably one of the the places that we see kind of the most interesting things around because the standard library affects all the models and all future models. So in my mind, it's a good place to start when you're doing cleanup or or want to do rename because as you fix a library um, files, you know, especially in the PDM system, if you rename a library file, it's able to fix the references for everything else. The tricky part is when you have two or three or four or more files that are all the same bolt, you know, that's a little trickier to clean up the data, but it's definitely well worth the effort. And one of the things like, if you can identify them, that helps a lot. Because even if you have to import those duplicate geometries with, you know that that duplicate uh, dashboard that you get in in PDM sometimes um, you can use a replace function and just kind of narrow it down to one model as opposed to the three or four that you may have floating around there. Yeah, and that's the other hard part about the library is that some manufacturers model their bolt on one axis. The content center might model their model on different axis. If someone handmade a washer or bolt you know, they picked whatever axis they wanted to model on. And so, you know, there are great tools in, in terms of being able to replace files, but um, some files are easier to um, fix if they have iMates and things like that versus others. So, um, you know, getting the, the library clean earlier on eliminates a lot of that headache when it comes to reuse. If everyone's reusing the same bolt, you don't have that. It's really the issue comes is when you have, you know, the same bolt in every product folder or every project folder. And now what do you do? You know, that kind of cleanup is very time intensive compared to starting a, a standards library sooner rather than later. And uh, anybody has any questions? I have another question. If you aren't in a PDM yet, what is the best way to handle cleaning and renaming library files without breaking all the assemblies? 
of the old uh, versions. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, Because it's like as soon as you rename it, most of the time you you really can't. If you rename it outside of a PDM, every assembly you open, you're going to essentially going to have to repoint it. And you know, if the library files are in one folder, you know, and you're using let's say an inventor, you know, you relink one. Inventor smart enough to usually to relink the rest of them. Um, the hard part is if the names changed. Um, it's definitely added tedious work. Um, I think the most important thing um, ahead of time is that I I would almost not rename them ahead of time. What I would be what I'd be far more interested in is making sure that all of the assemblies are referencing the same one, because renaming in a PDM system is very easy, but um, fixing the references and basically getting of getting rid of the duplicate files is I think more important than cleaning the name because in a PDM system that changing a name is very simple and having letting it fix all the references is simple the hard part is getting rid of four files that are the same and half the assemblies use one and some of the other assemblies use the other it's trying to avoid that kind creating that kind of um, mismatch and data discrepancy like if you can if you avoid that trap, you know that is probably where I see people spend the most amount of cleanup time, because now you got to replace them, and then if it breaks the constraints, you got to fix the constraints, and you know that is very time consuming. And so setting up a library ahead of time, or at least getting everyone referencing the same file from the beginning, or sooner rather than later, can really kind of stop the um, the cascading of these problems from getting larger. Yeah, stop the bleeding as you go. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say the, along the, the lines that Jason said, there's a couple, like the difference between two methods is like, if you rename it on the spot, then you're kind of creating a sense of urgency because when you ever, whenever you open it, it's gonna be like, I can't find it, point me in the right direction. The other way you would do it is, you know, either create a, a copy with the right name knowing that you're going to focus on that one part and replace it within all your assemblies. That way you open up your assemblies, it opens up fine without any errors, and you just go through and make sure that you're replacing those parts in that assembly and fixing the constraints as you go and, you know, ensuring that you're pointing to, to one part. Um, but definitely, like like Jason said, making sure that everybody's looking at the right library or the same library will will help you in the long run, stopping you from uh, creating more problems down the line and uh, you know if you're fixing them but you're creating more at the same time <laughs> and you're just stuck in limbo forever uh, just <laughs> yeah well and you guys have heard my my thought about this it's like you may spend a tremendous amount of time to create drawings and it's like and these you know drawings are essentially files but it's the blueprint to actually build a product that you actually sell that actually creates revenue which keeps these companies in business so it's like Sure, they're technically files, but these files, in my mind, are way more valuable than just your standard file. Yes, very much. If there is no more questions, I would like to thank everybody today. Thank Jason and Jose. Just I want to remind everybody on the 15th uh, will be our part two on how to set up your data management solution. Um, this is a three-part series, and then once we get done with this three-part series, we'll be having a, um, a roundtable of asset experts sometime in February, where we'll all be online to ask questions about um, PDM and PLM questions. Uh, so thank every I thank everybody for joining, um, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks.